Yeah, hello everybody. I guess some of you may know me or may have written, uh, may have read stuff I wrote. And I think only few of you have seen me actually talking about this topic, which is very important to me. And uh, this is actually something I created based on my experiences at SUSE Linux Distributor. And uh, this talk is called Myth-Busting Documentation. I thought this is very, very important because there's so many myths about documentation around. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. Nothing is written in stone, as you can see here. And I, I try to... Yeah, I try to have this in a little bit funny way, even though it is a very serious topic and there has been yeah, somewhat heated discussions over the last 10 years that I was to witness about the different approaches to documentation. And you can just lay back and feel fine, but in the end, this is, this is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to introduce myself shortly, then I'll show you some common myths about documentation and tell you what the perfect writer looks like, because we all... As you will see, we all need documentation writers. Then I'm going to destroy the myths one by one and have a short, some, some short words on automation and agile documentation, like an outlook into the future. So, who am I? Well, I'm a journalist, as you can see, and I was happy just two days ago to, to visit the Press Freedom Awards, so this is the most recent selfie I found. <laughs> and uh, I guess it's yeah, it looks like me. I was, for eight years, I was deputy editor-in-chief of the Linux magazine in Germany, an IT consultant and writer before that. And then for five years, I was the team lead of documentation at SUSE. And uh, I now am, since May, I am uh, again in journalism as senior managing editor at Heise in Germany here, big publishing house, and they're producing the IX, which is the magazine for the professional users. So everything that is uh, professional and doesn't need to be fixed every other day, so everything that is supposed to run and work. Um, there is documentation all around the world, everywhere, and there's a lot of common myths about it. And I really like this kind of documentation here. This is a very, very old uh, Painting, writing, I think it's some centuries old, and some of you may know where it comes from. But anyhow, let's start with the myths. One of the biggest myths is that I heard a lot from both developers and managers in development. No one reads the documentation. So, as I told you, I'm going to present the myths, and later I'm gonna debunk, I will debunk them. Good code does not need documentation. Everybody can write documentation. How often have you heard that, I guess? I don't know how many of you are in, 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 in say, bigger or medium-sized companies. So if you are in, in, in corporate IT, this is probably an even bigger topic because, my, to my experience, smaller companies who are more in direct contact with customers, they, uh, do not, they are not that prone to these um, myths. Then everybody, everybody of you, everybody wants to write documentation, of course. And there's experts for documentation everywhere. You find them all around the world. Everybody wants to, everybody can. And it's not a tech job at all. The writing is not a tech job. How can it be? And this was the worst thing that I ever heard. It was, that is why gender equality is much easier there. <laughs> I will come to that later. Then there is one thing I was really surprised to hear was that why should we document obscurity is good for our business? If the people don't know what we're writing about, they will buy our products and our consulting and our support. Then there's people who are only happy if they have their own tools, if they don't have to worry about other things, and if they can just stick to what they've always done and no matter what. And there is the concept of Heisen -Doku, uh, Heisenberg documentation, or Heisen -Doku, as we used to call it. That's where people, especially developers, say that the documentation people, they are so locked in into their world. They love their tools. They invest only time into uh, making their tools better. But at the same time, it's totally old and obsolete because those documentations, they are like the li librarians of software. Yeah? And everything they do is just 
complex and that, that a, a tool chain that doesn't make sense end and end. So this is, these are the myths that I will go, that I will debunk in a few minutes. Let's have a look at what is the perfect documentation writer. What does he look like? And I found with working with, at the end, 16 wonderful people at SUSE, wonderful documentation writers, some of them with more than 20 or 25 years of experience, I found out that these people have a long, long list of qualifications that are necessary to do a good job in documentation. And you will have a long list here. These people need, a good writer needs, or the perfect writer needs technical skills. So in, at a level that he could be an administrator at a customer, he needs to know the software he's writing about as well as his target audience after reading that. He needs to have development skills to understand and follow the developers and their teams. So he needs to understand what the developer actually does, what their changes are, or what this source code comment might mean. That's why he needs coding skills to understand the missing source code comment or to understand what's missing in the source code. Then we have language skills and, he, he, of course, because he's supposed to write, and he should be an expert in grammar. Then he should have emotional intelligence to do the mind switch from developer to user, to understand both what the coder meant and what the user wants, because this is often not really the same. And, of it's, was it the me? No. Then, and then there's project management skills because he needs to prioritize. He needs to find out what is important, what is not important, and accomplish the needs communicated by product, product management. And, of course, the ability to understand and improve documentation tools and workflows. Oh, and profound understanding of marketing, sales, support, and consultants' needs. So it's uh, an easy job, obviously, yeah? The perfect writer. It's, it's only the geeks, only the good ones, yeah? But that's not all. Because you also need understanding of legal, trademarks, licenses, up and downstream, corporate identity, and styles in language and, and layout. And that is a set that I really do not think that most of developers or development teams actually can have in their vision because it's such a big and huge amount of stuff, especially when it comes to licenses. What can we include in our documentation? What can we not include? Even with open source licenses, there is stuff that you simply cannot include, like pictures or whatever. Even if they are CC license, you may not be able to include them in your documentation license because your documentation license has, a, has different paragraphs that, that, that diverge from that. And that's stuff that you don't want to deal with. And also automated checks in documentation. I will talk about that later a little bit. Then uh, the different kinds of media, which have different styles and different needs. Lots of customers really still want printed books or printed documentation. Then um, you also need to understand the difference between stable versions or emerging products like we had at SUSE. SUSE created a lot of container products in the last years, and these products were sort of written from scratch, and so was the documentation. That is something completely different than just taking care, just in inverted commas, uh, taking care of stable version documentation, which is continuously updated. And... Uh, you need to set to be able to set up working setups for testing of software that doesn't even work right because it's alpha software. And you have to be able to retrieve the information from the developers, which in my team I was reported was about uh, something like 70% of the time was running after the developers and getting them to explain stuff and to show stuff to them. And this is the the, the slides are on the websites. The slides will be published, so you don't need to read everything here. This is more than I am able to say in this short time that I have. But the top 20 replies of programmers were exactly that. And my favorite is also number one, because this is the best thing you can say in times of containers. Short form for containers anywhere is it works on my machine. Tools for documentation to get the information we need from the developers. Of course, there is the foam bat and the whip that we created for ourselves. But the most um, successful tools were 
like this little hook on the left to drag the things out of the nose of the developers because they are not really not always that communicative, or of course the crystal, crystal uh, sphere, the crystal ball, to just guess the stuff. But nevertheless, the developers would act react in their own way. They would they're just nerds. Some of the I've seen some of the most skilled people I ever have met at SUSE, yeah? But they just, they just follow down their track and, yeah, they, they have things to do. And sometimes you have to drag them somewhere. You just have to get them, get hold of them, drag them somewhere, even against their will, and to pin them down to tell you what you need. And for that, we, we had to install quite some uh, ways of working with them, with development. We invented, for example, we had dedicated writers or engineering writers. The difference between the two is engineering writers were inside the engineering teams. They were immersed in the development team, in the group of the developers. So they were very close and always knew what was going on. They were in their sprints, in their meetings and everything. Whereas dedicated writers were in our team but dedicated to one software project. They were, little, they were integrated in our team, but close to the project too. Depending on the workflow of the development team, either one solution was better. Then we invented continuous documentation in sort of like to cope with the agile methods of some teams. And one thing that I was really driving forward very much to get as much input as possible was format and tool agnostic input. So just give us text. I don't care. I don't care. Give it, give it a, let it be Word document, Office document, plain text, email, markdown, wiki, ASCII doc, whatever. We don't care. And you should not care if you're a developer. You should not care. Just get us the content. We are the specialists for the rest. That was one thing that was very important for me. And this approach also helped a lot in, in the face of flame wars about formats and like ASCII doc versus docbook XML versus Sphinx or whatever frameworks there are. If you just tell people, I don't care, that's your thing. You do it like you want, we can, we can work with that. That all includes a lot of meetings. And as I said, we were working with sprints, squats, lots of agile methods and flexibility. The core input to documentation, and that may be debatable for you, but that's my findings, should come from product management. It should not come from development. Because development usually is not in contact with the target group, not directly co in contact with the user. But product management, they are the central information hub and goal setter for everybody. They are the guys who have to say no. So they have the money, they have the budget, they can tell, okay, we, we have to document this, otherwise we will not sell this product. Or they will say, no, we don't need to document this because we'll sell the product anyway. So it is their decision, at least in a bigger company like SUSE it was. And this is where the priorities are set. This is a, where a, we created documentation plans with them. We discussed what needs to be documented, and that would be like the, the, the plan for the next year for us, how we do documentation. And this is also where the plan is jettisoned. And I tell you, writers better do what, what uh, project, product management wants. It's not a good thing if writers do what a single developer wants. How, no matter how creative and how wonderful the, the new thing is that he has integrated here, yeah? documentation is one of the pillars of success of open source software for the customers. And the customers are in the center. So at SUSE and other big companies, you have like, um, yeah, you have several entities, several people, several group of people who are there directly working with the customers. That is the sales and sales engineers, consultants, even marketing and PR. Then you have support partners, every customer himself. Sometimes they, you, they started directly contacting us. And every colleague out in the field knows what the customer wants. And these should be the ones that have an impact on, so listen to your customers when you're doing documentation is very, very important. And back to the myths. So these were my learnings from SUSE. And back to the myths, and I'm going to debunk one by one. No one reads the documentation. Well, it's the opposite. The people who work with the customers, the ones I just mentioned, they tell us they actually read it. They need it. And 
interesting for me was this, especially in, in the Asia Pacific region, there were a high amount of customers who really would print out documentation or asked customers for a printed book version of the documentation. So that was surprising for me too in times like today. But still, then good code does not need documentation, something I heard very often from developers or also from management of development. And it's, it's not true because especially for open source, documentation is one of the pillars of success for open source com uh, companies. Um, other, many software tools only become usable thanks to detailed documentations. And if you are in a company, if you work in an IT department, and if you are responsible for working for functioning software or uh, environment and, sp and smooth processes, this will affect your daily work and even the success of your business. Just imagine you have this one colleague who is the only one who knows something about one workflow. Then he's got a car accident, he's in a, or whatever, as we used to say, he's eaten by a bear. <laughs> and uh, then you have, to, you have to train somebody on this. It is for many companies, it is like an insurance if they know we have a book, and after three days, this one person, this apprentice or whatever, is at a level that he can do the basic stuff there. This book is like an insurance to them. And that is why it's important for them. They really want to have this in a shelf or as a PDF or whatever and get somebody, ramp up somebody, onboard somebody on a task and replace somebody. This is an insurance for them. We heard that so often. And yeah, that's what I said. It's um, appreciated in terms of faster onboarding. Also, we documented our own documentation workflow and that worked quite well with onboarding people very well. Oh yeah, if you have questions, just interrupt me, but I'm sure there will be some time after my talk for questions. Um, the Marines wouldn't be the Marines if everybody could get in there, so I'm not thinking of the documentation uh, community or people as Marines, but um, if everybody can write documentation, I wonder why there is university degrees on technical documentation. So if it's that easy, I, why do so many people at universities waste their time on that? Then why does it take months of onboarding to integrate a writer, even good ones? Yeah? Because you need to learn a lot about the company, about the environment, about the customers, and all of the stuff that I said before. And then there is uh, stuff that is in the character, in the mindset of documentation people that I also addressed already, and I'm addressing later a little bit more, about bias and problems of assumed obviousness. That means they have to have the emotional intelligence to do the mind swap, to, to understand what is not self-understood for somebody who sees the software for the first time. And you have to keep to, to have an overview over what you're doing. Otherwise, you will end up in situations that you don't think that might be possible. So obviously, here was somebody who didn't know anything about encoding. This is on a train, a photo I took on a train. I think it was in Belgium, if I'm... And this is... There's a lot of skills. And even though lots of developers want to write documentations, um, and even though they love and care and know what they do, they are not in, not all of them, let's put it uh, carefully, not all of them are the best people you would want to write documentations. There's a part of, part of that is because they have a different view on the software they're developing, they're an insider. But um, I heard that from several sides, from consulting and from at conferences, that the, the, the developer is the, probably the best informed person, he's probably the least desired one to write the documentation, just because he's too much inside. And yes, I know, we, I heard this from a consultant who really told me, even though we don't have documentation for that, don't let these two, three people write it. They won't, this will not succeed. So every, yes, there's, there's probably more people who want to write documentation than there are people who are able to write proper documentation that is helpful for customers. And that's, again, because of the problems that I, said, uh, that I mentioned before. For example, these people often are not involved with legal, ma with legal questions, like maybe use this text. Some of them would just copy online stuff from other software projects, thinking this is open source, everything, and put it into enterprise documentation, which is part of a sold project, and then you run into license problems. 
So this is stuff that the documentation experts know. And uh, as I said before, remember the perfect writer. There is a lot of skills that is needed, and that is why it's simply wrong to say there is documentation experts everywhere. That's wrong. There is not many. It's, and that is, leads us directly to the wonderful statement one of my friends and colleagues, former colleagues said, when I told him that I was successful in raising the, um, the, the share of women in my team from one to seven, sort of like from five to one to eight to seven, so almost 50-50 when I left the team. I was very proud of that, and, but the, the comment that I heard was, well, it's so much easier in documentation. It's obvious that it's so much easier there because documentation isn't a tech job, isn't technical. And I had to, I had to t breathe in air and I said, are you aware of how many discriminating statements this sentence contains? <laughs> yeah? So it, it's, if you count them, I came to four or five groups that he dis discriminated with this one sentence. Yeah? And he thought about it, and just a few weeks ago, he still said, yeah, that was stupid. That was very stupid then. But it's just something that is in the mind of people, and that's just wrong. Because also in IT, well, there's many theories why women are still underrepresented in IT, but it wasn't always like that. And for those of you who have seen the movie about the moonshot, the Apollo program, or who are... Um, uh, who are a little bit aware of uh, World War II cryptography and early IT after World War II, they know that women had a very strong role then, much stronger than the men at the time. This group of women that you see here is the women from Bletchley Park. They broke the, they broke the Enigma, they broke the, or they broke the German cryptography then. Yeah? Then ENIAC. So just, just these, look up these... these um, uh, search ENIAC at Google and stuff. ENIAC was one of the first bigger computers after World War II, and it was almost only ladies working with it, uh, entering the data into this computer. ENIAC was used to calculate um, trajectories, I think is the English word for, um, for uh, not bombs, for rockets. Yeah, so the, the uh, where, how do we, how, which angle do we need so that it hits there and there, yeah? And there is one statement of one of the leaders, of the, one of the leading ladies of this ENIAC project who said that finally we have reached a point where the, the calculation is faster than the rocket. <laughs> and uh, Hidden Figures was the movie I was referring to with, about the Apollo program, about lots of the ladies who did the the calculations and stuff. And there's a wonderful picture of Margaret Hamilton, if you remember that. I don't know if you know that. But if you Google for her name and, and you will find it, she's standing there. She's a lady maybe that tall, and she's standing there. And beside her is a, a pile of paper. And that is the printed software. That is the printed code of the software of the Apollo program. program. It's as tall as she is, and she was the team lead of the program then. So up to the 60s, it was much more standard that women were in IT. In fact, computers was a term that was describing female data scientists, we would say today, or female workers at a computer. It was associated with a female person. A computer was a lady then. So, and no, I, I don't agree with this friend of mine. So, if you would like to do some research, it's really interesting. Somewhere in the way, in the last decades, we have lost that a little bit. But hopefully, we are getting there again now. So the, one of the last myths to debunk is obscurity. I heard that when I was talking to another open source company, a big one. And somebody asked me, how do you at SUSE decide what not to document? And I'm like, what? And then this person explained, yeah, there is stuff that you want your support to make money with, right? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, there's really stuff that we do not document because we want our, our support to have a lot of tickets from the customers to make money with. And I'm like, okay, this is not open source at all. And that's, uh, obscurity doesn't help you there at all because there's three pillars for success of an open source company. That is... Consulting, support, and documentation. Within consulting and support, you also have the packaging topic of uh, giving um, updated security patched packages to people, updated with new features, and then, and, and. But you have services and support, means they ha you, you give them help when they need it, you, give them, you guarantee help, yeah? and documentation. 
and of course, I don't need to say that hiding that this hiding information mentality is against our all open source business. And one thing that's also not that new is that we have a different situation of first contact with customers. Our customers, when they come in contact with open source products, they inform themselves ahead of buying. When in former times, marketing was the first contact with a customer and they would come in and hand in their brochures and their PDFs and whatever. Uh, today, they meet customers that are already well informed. And if these customers don't find the relevant information in type of documentation or similar, huh? they'll just turn away and go to your competitor because the code can be used by somebody else. And if they have the documentation, they will think the customer, the potential customer will think, well, this other company probably has no clue about that. Huh? And they will take the software from those that have a clue, if there are. So the Heisen Doku, oops, already said that it's it's about tool-centric, or the, uh, the, the, the myth that documentation people are always very tool-centered. And um, that is, in my opinion, that is wrong, because documentation needs a lot of tools, but it's mu so much more than only the tools. We did a lot of uh, automated stuff in the background. We did style language checks. We, did, uh, te we tested on logical consistency, legal and license topics, and a lot of other stuff in the background. And we... At least at SUSE, there were like 20, yeah, there were 20 years of experience in choosing the tools that were most suitable for that. And that is, for example, something that directly leads you to why are you using XML? Because we have a lot of machinery in the background that is working with that. And that XML, of course, XML was made for humans, not, not made readable for humans, but for machines. And it has many advantages of checking and stuff to other languages, just for an example. So, and customers, of course, make a big difference. No, companies think of making a difference between marketing and documentation stuff, but for customers, everything that is tech or has tech, is tech related, will be considered documentation. The customer doesn't care where it comes from. If it is a white paper that was written by, by, by marketing, or if it is uh, a chapter in documentation, the customer will take it as documentation. And that is also one thing that documentation knows because we talk to the marketing people. We are in contact with them. And that is also something that developers rarely are or will be. Two minutes, that's good. So I'm already almost done. I'm, Short, I will shortly talk about the future and about automation and agile, stuff that we were very much um, concerned with. Um, what do you, I don't know what you think about automating documentation. Language. I, am, yeah, I see development, but I am not that uh, convinced yet. Because I think the source code of documentation is language, and language is not standardized and or formalized. There have been approaches, look it up, in air, airplane technology, for airplane uh, documentation. STE is a simplified technical English language, and there have been lots of attempts, but so far I haven't seen uh, reliable and working automated documentation. That is because documentation is not standardized, other than code, other than the code that you are working with. That is standardized, and that code usually always is um, clear and precise. Language is not. Like you see here, put file A in directory B and rename it. It, is, it depends on the context, and you need to have prior knowledge to all of that to know whether you shall rename the directory or the file. And there's lots of examples like that. My former colleague Tanya did a whole talk about issues like that, addressing them to developers. Because here we have assumed obviousness. Is if you've done this 20 times, you just know that it's the directory you need to remain, rename. Huh? But if you've never done it before, you don't know. And that is assumed obviousness. And that is why developers are the, le the least um, wanted to write the documentation. I've said the other things before. Another thing is terminology. Just, I just pick one example you need to pick the term terminology thoroughly. We have that 
also at SUSE, we have a whole list. We have libraries of that, and that is what documentation people work with, and that is what marketing works with. They have an impact on it. That is what developers never know, and they don't need to know. And, for example, we have the, you have the peacock mantis shrimp that is not a peacock, not a mantis, and not a shrimp. But it's called like that for whatever reasons. Agile. These are the best advice, because I'm almost running out of time. These are the best advice I could find on Agile documentation. It is a really an interesting topic, and uh, there is a lot of discussion on it. This, these are the things that we found out to be working. Yeah? We have to think and plan and work iteratively, like, Agile, uh, like the Agile Manifesto says. Um, we are, with also part of this talk, is going more into the user realm into asking the user, finding out what they want, and analyze it, treat it as a product, do what's best for the customer, create and support a writing process that enables contributions from outside, automation also here, and there is also the CMS that comes in. There's a very good link about technical writing and agility, and this is the last slide. Um, this is what hopefully is the outcome if you have more agile documentation Honestly, I've never seen that working, but there is, I've seen a lot of agile development working, but I've also seen a lot of agile development not working. So I would love, if you are in a company that has this working, yeah, then let me know. The graphics is very simple. So you see classic documentation is the red line. You have a lot of work at the beginning yeah, and a lot of work generally over all of the time. And with the Agile documentation, you have to do the documentation much later, but it will be much less work. That is the promise. I have never seen that in process. So if, if you see that, then let me know. So this is the end. <laughs>